Hello and welcome. I'm Richard Crispin, CEO of Collaborate Up and your moderator for the Chiefs Forum. Today, we're going to be having a conversation with chiefs, chiefs of staff, chief executives, and many other chief executives as we have a conversation about what is going to dominate the next 100 days. The Chiefs Forum, co-hosted by Collaborate Up and the Washington Times and sponsored by Philip Morris International, seeks to put you, our viewers and listeners, inside the minds of the chiefs and inside the room with them as they think about some of the biggest and most consequential decisions that are gonna shape our next 100 days. We wanna put you in the Oval Office, in the C-suite and in the boardroom with them so that you can think like they think, so that you can see what they see and hear what they are hearing. Now, this is not gonna be your typical political chat show. No, instead we're gonna have a more nuanced conversation. We're going to leave the vitriol and the partisanship aside, and instead we're going to have a conversation about how decisions are made, how people are thinking about uh, who they're going to talk to, how they're going to engage their stakeholders, and the process that goes into how the work actually gets done. Our session is going to proceed in two parts. Our first panel is going to be with our White House Chiefs of Staff, the relatively small group of people who have actually served in that position for presidents of the United States. And then second, we're gonna have a conversation with chief executives from across the civil, private and public sectors, including chief executives, chief of innovation, chief investment and other chief ex officers. But first, we've got our White House Chiefs of Staff queued up here and I'm gonna dive right in with my first question. And my first question is, what are the issues that they think will shape the next 100 days and why? And I want to turn first to you, Mac McClarty. You are kind of the dean of this club. You, I think, started serving the earliest under President Bill Clinton as White House Chief of Staff, but you've also advised Presidents Jimmy Carter and George H.W. Bush. From your perspective, what's going to dominate the next 100 days, Mac McClarty? Richard, thank you, first of all, for convening this session. I am delighted. It's always just a, a great pleasure and privilege to be with fellow chiefs. I think Andy Card is the longest serving chief of staff, so he may arm wrestle me about the, the Dean moniker, but you've assembled a great program and uh, not only in the private sector, but also uh, focusing on the public sector as well, as you say, the, 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 the chief office there. And uh, it's good to be with Mick and Josh. I, I think the first hundred days are always consequential in a liftoff of the president after he or she takes that oath of office. Uh, the second hundred days is equally important. I think we'll see a continuation, Richard, of uh, the coronavirus dominating uh, the Biden-Harris administration. I think it's just essential from a health standpoint, a well-being standpoint, and an economic standpoint. I think we saw that the first 100 days. It appears there is a modestly more uh, guarded, favorable trend line here in our country, but still such serious challenges around the world, particularly in India, Brazil, and other countries. I think another key question of the second 100 days, Richard, will be whether or not President Biden can reach out effectively and engage with Republican members of the Senate and the House and achieve some measure of bipartisanship, which he talked about in the campaign, some measure of unity in the country in the infrastructure package. It seems to me he's making a serious effort to do that. I think there is goodwill uh, on the Republican side to engage in that manner, we'll have to see. Thirdly, I think you always have what I refer to as UFOs, unforeseen occurrences. We saw that on the Colonial Pipeline with the uh, disruption of, of uh, uh, gasoline flow from uh, the East Coast, the midsection of the country to the East Coast. So I think those will be three areas that we'll need to look at going forward, Richard. Perfect, thank you. So we've got coronavirus recovery, reaching out across the aisle, especially and, and especially on infrastructure, but also bringing the country together, unifying us, and the unforeseen occurrence. What is going to be that wild card? And so speaking of cards, next I want to turn to you, Andy <laughs> Card. You were President George W. Bush's first White House Chief of Staff, but you also bring a perspective as a former cabinet officer, having served as Secretary of Transportation and in the C-suite at General Motors. So what would you add to what Matt just laid out for us? Well, thank you, Richard, for having me. And I thank Philip Morris for sponsoring this in the Washington Times. It's great to be with Collaborate Up. And I, I really enjoy to be with the other chiefs of staff and the CEOs that will be following us. But I feel that you clearly have to pay attention to what's happening in the economy. And we are poised to have, uh, I'm going to say, 
uninvited consequences to some of the work that's been done to recover from COVID. And one of them may be that people aren't going back to work the way they thought they would. So I think you're gonna to have to pay attention to the unemployment rate and, and, and the job opportunities that can't be filled. And I think it's gonna have an impact on our economy. I also worry about the, the pressure on inflation in part because the government has been spending so much money, but also because of the, I'm gonna say the pent up demand that is challenging the supply chains as we get ready to recover from this challenging pandemic that actually was a challenge for our economy as well. So I would put those two things there. And then you have a world, a world that is not cooperating very well when it comes to even the issues of the pandemic, never mind the challenges in the Middle East going on right now and some of the challenges in China. So there's a lot that the chief of staff will be paying attention to in the next 100 days, I think are gonna be even more critical to understand the nature of where America is uh, than the first 100 days for President Biden. And so I think that's, it's critically important that uh, President Biden uh, help find a way to demonstrate to people who are not standing on the fringe, but are kind of standing in the middle saying, help, we want to know that things are going well. Is your, is your leadership strong and steady? Is Congress being invited to participate in finding some of these solutions? But there are real problems and we need to get together to solve them. So I'm calling for people to have the courage to compromise and mm. to meet the obligations together rather than assign them to somebody who is outside of the responsibility. Mm. So I'm hearing themes of, uh, of dealing with the unforeseen. We heard that from Mac as well. Also around leadership, American leadership. How are we going to lead through and deal with the unforeseen consequences of perhaps a slower return to work, persistent unemployment, um, increasing pressure on inflation, uh, but also about the lack of international cooperation and bipartisan cooperation on issues that might seem easy to cooperate on, like the pandemic, but also things more complex like China and the Middle East. Um, and how do we really deal with what I would call the movable middle? How do we get uh, that cooperation with the people in the center? Uh, let me turn to you, Josh Bolton. Josh, you were the White House Chief of Staff for George W. Bush and also the head of the Office of Management and Budget, one of the lesser known, but one of the most powerful offices in Washington, D.C. Uh, what would you add to Mac and Andy's comments? Well, uh, first of all, Richard, thank you for uh, for having me. Washington Times, all of our hosts, and a, a privilege to be here with uh, three of my favorite former chiefs. It's a it's a great club, and these are distinguished members of it. Um, having introduced me as a uh, as a former budget chief, a uh, <laughs> distinction that Mick Mulvaney shares. Um, and, and other chiefs of staff have shared. Um, I, uh, I should highlight the budget issues as extremely important to the country, uh, but probably little noticed in, in our politics. They, it has not been a, a subject of significant uh, concern for many years. Um, and uh, it, it may not be for now, but uh, it, our, our budget deficit and the piling trillions of debt that <clears throat> is going on as we speak uh, is not at all a problem until it is. Hmm. And, uh, hmm. and when it is a problem, it will, be, it will be a massive problem for the United States. When I, uh, when I was first uh, came in as budget director, in, uh, in 2003, when, uh, when my mentor, Andy Card, was chief of staff and, and sent me across West Executive Avenue into exile at, at OMB, <laughs> uh, I was petrified because I was being handed a situation in which the, uh, the budget deficit might exceed $400 billion for the coming year. And I thought for sure the markets were going to punish the uh, uh, the uh, treasury bills, um, the the bond markets would melt down, and we would we would face economic collapse. Today, if you were facing a four hundred billion dollar deficit, everybody would be celebrating. And um, 
and the times have changed. The problem has not. It's just a question of how well we navigate it from here out. Mm. So the budget, it, I, I love what you said there. It's not a problem until it, it is. And uh, it's not been a dominant issue in our politics, but it, it, it could become one. And it's sort of this kind of ticking time bomb that many of us are not necessarily keeping our eye on. Um, Mick Mulvaney, I want to pull you in here. Uh, as Josh pointed out, you also share the distinction of being a White House Chief of Staff and a Budget Chief for President Trump, and you were also in Congress, so you bring the the perspective of the Hill. What would you uh, bring to this conversation? What do you think are the issues, and how would you build off what uh, your other chiefs have said? Thanks, Richard. Thanks for bringing us all together. I can't tell you how helpful these gentlemen were to me. Uh, we don't talk about that publicly much, but uh, it was extraordinary to work with uh, each of these gentlemen. Uh, when I was in the White House. Um, not surprisingly, um, once you're an OMB director, it's sort of hard not to be, so I'm going to stay in the fiscal space, but you're absolutely right. I'm going to put a little bit of a congressional hat on, which is to remind people there's really two times of year when the really, really nasty stuff gets done. Not surprisingly, it has to do with the vacation calendar in Congress. Uh, one of those times is the, time in the, is the run-up to the time before Christmas, and the other is the run-up to the time before the August recess. Um, that falls the next 100 days. What's facing the Biden administration? Two things I think that bear some at least uh, elucidation. Number one, uh, they need a spending bill by the end of September in order to keep the government open. Um, traditionally, that has and will continue to be a challenging time for any administration. Uh, added to that, uh, layered on top of that is that uh, technically, I think the, uh, the debt ceiling uh, will be breached in July using the extraordinary measures. Um, Treasury should be able to keep things going until generally maybe middle fall, early winter, depending on who you listen to. Um, always fraught times in Washington, D.C. Um, and things that tend to to exacerbate existing difficulties. It's, it's, it's tough to do a, a spending bill and tough to do a debt ceiling even when folks are getting along, um, even more so obviously when things are, are tough in Washington, DC. So I think the administration, in addition to all the other things the chiefs have rightly mentioned, including those unknown things that, that Matt McClarty correctly brings attention to, is just this, this, this August is a tough time in Washington, DC when you're trying to keep the government open and then when you add a debt ceiling to that, it's going to be very challenging uh, next 100 days. Terrific. So um, I, one of the things I'm hearing from all of you, I kind of want to move us into our next phase of questions here about how you're going to go about or how, how you would have gone about thinking through and making decisions with regard to these issues. And uh, you mentioned here, Mick, and, and, and several of the others, the calendar and the fact that there's a different pace between how the White House might want to operate and the executive wants to operate and how the legislative wants to operate and how quickly you can get things done and how that puts a lot of pressure on the ability to make decisions and to compromise and to work with the other side. So Mick, if maybe I could stick with you because you've served in both branches, um, how do you think people on the Hill and the White House are gonna go about thinking through and making these decisions? Who would you be calling right now? How would you be, be, be setting up meetings? What would you be doing? Yeah, um, it, it's it, it talk about the calls you're making, but also the calls you are receiving. Keep in mind, there's a lot of other things that an administration has to be doing in its first 100 days into the second 100 days. I don't think, unless I've missed something in the last couple of days, for example, that the Biden administration has named any of the major ambassadors yet. Um, the phone is ringing with folks who are interested in those positions, interested in, in, in knowing other people are, are getting those positions. There's a lot of pressure inside the West Wing to keep things moving quickly on stuff that doesn't always rise up to make the front page of the paper. And I apologize when an airplane goes over here. Um, so they've got that going. They then got the Senate schedule to deal with. The Senate doesn't like to work. Uh, I say that as a, as a proud member of the House of Representatives. Um, <laughs> and they have other priorities. They have their priorities. So get to the phone calls you'd be making right now if you're in the West Wing. I'd be on the phone, obviously, to the leadership in the House, um, but to the the committee chairman in the Senate and even the rankers uh, in, in the Senate to let them know that things are moving s quickly, that things are moving smoothly, uh, to let them know that you know what you're doing in the administration and then encouraging them to take things up as expeditiously as they possibly can. Uh, by the way, I haven't even mentioned judges or U.S. attorneys or all those other positions that need to get filled. Um, and if they're not filled by summer, sooner or later it becomes a story and you just don't want that. So um, there's frenetic activity in the West Ring right now pushing up against this immovable object on the Hill, um, but that's no different for this administration than it is for anybody else. Mm. So we've got to deal with appointments. We've got to figure out who's going in which seats on the bus, so to speak. We also have to balance the, the different schedule that the Senate operates under than everybody else. Um, 
Andy, I know you were uh, you were both in the cabinet and as as well as uh, as serving as White House Chief of Staff. I mean, give us that perspective. You know, as Mick Wright raises the issue of appointments and and how do you even decide like who gets to make these decisions and and how do you balance between the the cabinet you know where the cabinet officers get to make versus what other people in the West Wing get to make. That's the burden that a chief of staff has. Uh, presidential decisions belong to the president. Uh, many government decisions rightfully belong to the people who are in charge of the agencies around government. And uh, in the White House, you have to be careful not to be making government decisions because it takes time to make those decisions, but to know about the decisions. But it's also important that you push decisions down rather than pull them up. Um, so I, I don't like. I didn't like it when people were trying to get the president to make government decisions, and they were not doing their job. And the president needed time to make the tough presidential decisions that are always the toughest in government. Can you give us an example? Like what's a presidential decision versus a? a well, I hope I hope no president made the decision to paint battleships gray, because <laughs> that's a government decision, and it's trillions and trillions of dollars of gray paint. But I hope the president didn't agonize over what color to paint the battleships. So, and there, most people want the president to make every decision in government so that they can blame the president. The president will own the responsibility, but they tr truly trust. The C-suite in government is the cabinet, and uh, the cabinet is is not really, they don't get to vote on issues and say, Mr. President, you can do that, which we vote to do. The president motivates them and their job is to lead, but uh, most presidents do empower their agency heads to make tough decisions within those agencies. And while he's making tough decisions about uh, the peripheral vision that the president has to have, as well as making sure that the tunnel vision is being handled by people who he believes in and will back up. Mm -hmm. So the chief of staff's job is to manage the calendar and the clock and one of the great burdens is that everybody wants the president to do everything all the time. And unfortunately, time does not permit the president to do everything. So mm -hmm. the chief of staff has to manage the clock. I would say, number one, we got to get an OMB director. There's mm -hmm. no OMB director that's been confirmed. And yes, spending is a problem. Paying attention to when the debt ceiling has to be uh, readdressed is a challenge. And there are huge challenges around the budget when it comes to fixing the debt ceiling, because every member of Congress knows that it's a must pass bill. Nobody wants to vote for it. So they will spend a lot of time trading and we need an OMB director that is in charge of the trade. Mm -hmm. So we have to, the, the job of the chief of staff is to manage the clock also to kind of traffic cop, which decisions get made by whom and making sure that decisions aren't landing on the president's desk that really belong on somebody else's desk. Uh, Josh, I mean, what, what's, what's your perspective on this? I mean, I know we need to, we, uh, uh, Andy referenced the need to bring in an, an OMB director. Uh, how, how are you setting up things when you were there to manage that clock and to determine and traffic cop those issues and decisions? Well, I had, I had great examples to follow, not, not lead card. Um, but uh, I think, Richard, you and Andy put your finger on it. That's, I think that's the most important function of the chief of staff is, fig is uh, determining what really is a presidential decision mm -hmm. uh, and what should be pushed back down to the agencies. And if it's a presidential decision, making sure that the president hears from everybody who's got a stake in it and uh, gets the best possible advice to make a good decision. That's that's the chief of staff's job is enabling the president to make good decisions on truly presidential issues. So you've got to do the sort. Now, what one of the things that happens in uh, especially in Republican cabinets where a lot of former CEOs end up in the cabinet, they take these cabinet jobs and they think they're in charge. <laughs> they're not. They are, they are heads of subsidiaries. There is a CEO of the organization and it is the president of the United States. And the, the chief of staff has a difficult job in making sure that all of the subsidiary uh, CEOs, that is the, the cabinet members, understand that they get to run their business um, but when it gets to be an important enough decision, then the decision belongs to the president through a White House process. And that's, 
uh, that's often a, a, a challenge that the, uh, that the chief of staff needs to enforce. And sometimes, as Andy said, the chief of staff needs to push a decision back down to the, uh, to the cabinet officer. I, uh, more than once, I'm, I'm sure my colleagues found this as well, more than once I found myself saying to a cabinet member, yes, I can get you that meeting with the president, um, but my advice to him would be that you're taking to him an issue that it is not presidential. Mm. He may also conclude that you are wasting his time. Do you <laughs> want to take the risk of the president concluding that you're wasting his time? And in almost every case, they say, no, I'll take care of it. <laughs> Mac, what about uh, you, you also, I'm sure you dealt with all these issues. Um, what about the other players inside the, the, the White House and, and in the executive complex? You've got, we've talked about the cabinet officials, we've talked about the relationship with the Hill. What about the office of the first lady or uh, with others uh, in and around the president and the advisors and the other people that make up um, you know, the, the rest of the process? Richard, you're really uh, drawing out and getting some uh, insightful and, and depthful commentary from my fellow chiefs, as I would expect to be the case. And what you glean from that is just the enormous amount of activity and work and decisions that have to be made, particularly during the first year of any presidency. And Vic noted about getting a team in place, your government in place. We were very fortunate to have all of our cabinet confirmed uh, by the day after the inauguration, save one position. That, that is no longer uh, kind of the way of Washington. You've also heard a lot about the budget. You put your, uh, you, you, you identify the right point. I do think President Biden has put together a, a very uh, coherent, experienced uh, uh, group in the White House, uh, in terms of the White House staff. And in most cases, they have worked together both with President Biden and with each other. And that kind of coherence and familiarity, I think, will serve him well. The key coordinating policy agents, uh, agencies or, or leaders in the White House, as my fellow chiefs know, are the National Security Council, the National Economic Council, which we actually established in the Clinton administration, and kind of combine that with the Domestic uh, Policy Council. Those are th three very key positions, but you've also got the cabinet secretary going to Andy's point and Josh's point about cabinet members. And certainly in every presidency, the first lady is an important office as well as individual and leader. Certainly was with Hillary Clinton in our administration, but you can look at any president and that is a key office and that the office of the first lady must be integrated in the White House activities, uh, Richard. So I think you're, you're identifying exactly the right points. The final thing I would say um, and Josh or Andy mentioned about, uh, I think Josh did about CEOs, having been a CEO of a New York Stock Exchange Company, I think what really struck me, even though I had the privilege to work with other presidents, but not uh, full time, is the speed of decision making in the White House. It, it is much quicker and faster paced uh, in the public sector in the White House than it is the private sector, not necessarily legislative, but the speed of decisions uh, are, are very demanding, and the breadth of issues which you're hearing from other chiefs. Mm -hmm. Those are two very, very significant points in my view. So if we could stick with that, because I, I want to, because Mick brought this in as well, the, the issue of time and how time and the calendar can really affect things. You're saying that the uh, decision-making can go quite quickly inside the White House. I don't know that people really associate quickness and our government necessarily in their minds. So yeah. really yeah. interesting that you're, you're bringing that in. But how do you how do you manage conflict as well when you're under time pressure? So you you mentioned several centers of power here: the National Security Council, the National Economic Council, the Cabinet Secretary, the cabinets, the, the cabinet officials themselves, the First Lady. The yeah. How, how do you manage when those are in conflict with one another and you're under time pressure? How do you deal with it? I'll ask you that first, Mac. Well, <laughs> that's that's an inevitable part of the job. Uh, it's why the chief of staff uh, job has been referred to as the chief javelin catcher <laughs> on, from time to time, and, and it is. Look, I think the key, and, and Josh, I think, alluded to it earlier, uh, Richard, I think you have to develop uh, a level of relationship and trust with your colleagues within the White House and within the cabinet and within the Congress. Um, and I think 
the president and vice president have to feel that the chief of staff and his or her office is an honest broker, that you're going to make certain the president hears all the relevant points of view in an organized, timely, serious, fair-handed manner. Mm -hmm. And once, once that occurs, if you do the process generally right and you do the best you can, particularly with time constraints, everybody has been part of the conversation, but then you have to close on decisions. And what I was really referring to, you're, you're right, but in the private sector, you're, you're not under the public scrutiny generally that mm -hmm. you are in the White House. And that's what accelerates that decision process. So I think an honest broker is absolutely key uh, to any chief of staff in his relationships with his colleagues in the White House, the cabinet and members of Congress. Mm. Josh, you all, you also brought up this issue of conflict and, and managing the conflict. What, what would you add to what Mac just said? Um, the, the chief's job is to, is to bring the conflict out. And uh, I, I a counterintuitive element here that I found, and I, and I think most of my fellow chiefs also found, is that uh, on many issues, you're, you're managing conflict between different offices, different cabinet departments, and making sure that uh, on a presidential issue, the president is hearing from, from all the sides, and you're trying to keep people in a place where they're not, they're, you know, they're not physically assaulting each other uh, in the meetings that lead up to the presidential meeting. But, they, but the counterintuitive element I want to throw in here is that I found myself frequently in the position of trying to provoke conflict among right. colleagues because they get into the Oval Office, and I, I see my, my fellow chiefs nodding their heads, they get into the Oval Office and all of a sudden, in the presence of the president, president in in the uh, in the hallowed grounds of the Oval Office, things are kind of mellower, and they don't want to put a really tough decision on the president's plate. So they they kind of take the edges off their arguments. And the truth is, first of all, no decision gets to the president unless it's pretty hard mm -hmm. to begin was easy, it doesn't get to the president. Uh, and when it's hard, it's important for the president to hear the sharpest version of the disagreeing points of view. And then he gets to make a decision. That's what, that's what presidents are there for. I, I recall once being in the Oval Office with President Bush, uh, George W. Bush, and uh, a fellow came in who was thinking about running for uh, the Republican nomination in uh, in 2008, uh, and he was looking for President Bush's advice. And President Bush said, well, uh, I think you probably ought to do it, but tell me something. Do you like to make decisions? Hmm. And, and the fellow said, uh, well, yeah. No, I, he said, do you really like to make decisions? Because that's what this job is. You make hard decisions all day long, and you gotta love that. Otherwise, you're not suited to be president. Mm -hmm. The tough, the may, as you said, it's not a tough, it's not a presidential decision unless it's a really tough decision. Um, Mick, I saw you nodding your head a lot there. Uh, your thoughts there on how, how to how to perhaps provoke conflict, but also manage through conflict. Yeah, I, I had to laugh because Josh almost took the words out of my mouth. I actually got a little bit uncomfortable when there was no conflict. Um, but his point about how there might be conflict in the in the uh, in the outer oval as you wait to go into the Oval Office to meet the president. <laughs> but by the time you get in there, all of a sudden people start to go a little bit soft. And I actually remember one time when everybody got in, in there, they had disagreed uh, fervently. I can't remember the issue. It doesn't make any difference um, in the Roosevelt room before we went in and we went in and it sounded like everybody was agreeing. I remember the president turning to me and goes, it's, if everybody agrees, then why are we here? Huh. Um, and that's. So we tried to encourage dissent. Uh, I found that our best decision making was done when we had vigorous dissent. And some of the things that I, I think didn't go as we had planned were when we didn't have that level of, of, uh, of the other side of the argument. I, in fact, I saw my job in large part to make sure that the other side of the argument was in the room. Mm. Um, I think if you get into a group think situation, history is taught that that gives us bad results. Um, at small levels, at large levels, you can't have everybody agreeing all the time. 
uh, number one, that's not a presidential decision if that's the case. And number two, you're probably not getting a good decision. Um, so no, encouraging dissent is almost part of the job as much as time management and everything else. Mm. So what I, I'm hearing that as a, as a chief of staff, you have to be yourself comfortable with uh, conflict as well as uh, provoking that conflict, bringing out the, the different sides of the argument and framing something that, that a president can actually decide. Um, Andy, I'd like to turn to you on this. And, and I, what I've heard is like, we, we have to manage these conflicts. We have to kind of bring the conflicts to a head. But then how do you, once you've made the decision, once the president has made the decision, how do you go about bringing everybody back together again? Uh, particularly if the sharp knives came out uh, early. First of all, the, the role of a chief of staff who serves at the pleasure of the president is to work every day and not seek that pleasure. So mm. you're actually working against the expectation because you want the president to be uncomfortable making tough decisions because they're tough. And if an easy decision gets to the president, the chief of staff didn't do their job. The president should make tough decisions. But once a tough decision is made, you are fully on board with that decision. And you, you don't want any president to make a decision without being optimistic that they made the right decision. Mm. It's a really mm. tough decision, but they made the right decision. Therefore, the chief of staff's job is to make sure everybody who is obligated to implement that decision understands the president has made the right decision. Now we've got to take it and get it done. And the, yes, that's the chief of staff's job. But if the president is, doesn't like his own decision or her own decision, it's very hard to motivate people to implement it. Mm. And the White House does not get to implement most decisions a president makes. They're implemented by departments and agencies and sometimes, you know, a platoon leader. And, mm -hmm. and so, yes, the president has got to be confident in the decisions that are made and the chief of staff has to take that confidence and try to infect everybody with it because we want the decision to be implemented to live up to the president's expectation. Mm. So the president, so that's really, I, I think that's also kind of counterintuitive that really the key to getting everybody else on board is to make sure that the president himself or herself is really comfortable with the decision um, itself. That's, that's, that's a great insight. Um, we're coming towards the, the tail end of our, of our time together, but we, we've still got a few more, about, about 12 more minutes or so together. I want to ask you guys to think about something. I'm going to come back to you on it. I'd love to hear if you have a story that you think really illustrates either the best parts of being chief or the worst parts of being chief and that whole decision-making process. But before I get to that, uh, my last question made me think of something, which is that I'm noticing, and I, I think I'd be remiss to not point out, that uh, we all look alike on this con on this conversation right now. We are all, um, I I'm of Latino origin, but we're mostly white looking men on this call. And I looked, I looked for a, 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 you know, somebody who did not look like us as a White House chief of staff. And unfortunately there haven't been any. What do we do about that? What, what, what should be, what, what can, what should be done um, to encourage more diversity in that position? And uh, Andy, I'll start with you. Well, first of all, it, it's not up to anybody else's call who the chief of staff should be other than the president. Mm. If the president is not comfortable with the person, they shouldn't have him as chief of staff. And this is not an election. It's not an audition. And in fact, I learned that if anyone applies to be the chief of staff, chances are they shouldn't be the chief of staff. Huh. <laughs> um, none of, I don't know any of us that said, hey, I want to be the chief of staff. No, I was blindsided when the president asked me to be his chief of staff, and I actually challenged him and said, why do you want me to be your chief of staff? Yeah. So, um, and in terms of, so I'm not, the diversity, the chief of staff shouldn't be hired because of diversity. They should be hired because that's who the president believes can deliver an organization. And the chief of staff's job is to organize the White House and then have a process for decision-making and a process for implementation of those decisions. Mm. And it's, it's really a dynamic that is crucial to success. And the president should feel very comfortable with the chief of staff, comfortable enough so that they can fire them without feeling guilty. Mm. So it, it's, it's an awkward situation, uh, but I, I honestly believe that the chief of staff should have a brutally candid relationship with the president and accept 
uh, I told the president, as soon as I become your chief of staff, I can't be your friend. You're mm. my friend and I don't want to let you down, but you cannot feel bad about being upset with me because I'm your friend. No, I'm, I'm in charge of the chairs in the meeting and the information that comes to you. If you're not happy with me, you cannot feel bad about telling me you're not happy with me and saying goodbye, get out. Yep. And I hope that when I leave, you'll treat me as a friend, but you'll be my friend forever. And I won't try not to let you down. Mm. Um, Matt, your thoughts on, on how to hire the, 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 a, a good chief of staff? Well, I think Andy's comments are, are very, uh, very, very thoughtful and, and, and on point as usual. I, I think it, it is unique uh, to the president. The chief of staff does serve at the pleasure of the president. And I think there's also, Richard, some, some time element in the presidency that comes into play. For example, in my case, I had certainly not sought the job. I had never worked for Governor Clinton. But there was a familiarity, a trust there that President-elect Clinton felt he needed in his first year or two years in office. That changes, I think, over time with the presidency as it does uh, in, in past presidencies. I, I think you also have to be politically pretty compatible with the president that you serve. Uh, hmm. I, I think you can't be out of step there. I think it almost goes without saying. But at the end of the day, there has to be a measure of real depth of mutual trust and mutual respect. And the chief of staff, in my opinion, has to be comfortable uh, really being very candid with the president, but in an effective manner, in private, in a trustful way. I think that's absolutely, absolutely essential. Mm, thank you. Uh, Josh, your thoughts, diversity and hiring for the chief position. Yeah, well, I, uh, I endorse everything that Andy and Mac just said about the president having to be comfortable, uh, I mean, really comfortable with the, with the chief of staff. Um, and uh, that's probably one reason why we've all been white men in the, in the chief's office, because with, uh, with one exception, uh, our, our presidents have been white men. And um, they... Uh, but I, 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 I candidly was, was surprised that, uh, that President Biden didn't, uh, didn't break the string of white men in, uh, in the chief of staff's office. I, I thought he was likely to, to reach out uh, for a woman to, uh, to fill that role. And I think there were several well-qualified ones who could have. Uh, but don't forget, the average longevity of a chief of staff is, uh, I think, two years and four months, something like that. Maybe, Maybe it, less. <laughs> after the Trump administration, Mick, it's gotten lower. I will point out that Obama had three and a half in his first term. So um, we had four, sort of three and a half. But yeah, you're right. That life expectancy, I think it's about 20 months or something like that. It's, okay, it's gone below. Okay, thank you, Mick. It's gone below two years. So uh, even President Biden, if, even if he's only a one-term president, is likely get to have an opportunity to, uh, to put a woman or a person of color into that, uh, into that seat and it'd be a good thing. Excellent. Mick, your thoughts? Yeah, real quickly, I think it's going to happen uh, soon. It's, it's, it's almost inevitable, and it should be. Um, what you're starting to see, I think it's mostly a, a function of age. Um, than it is gender and race. You've got really good, talented young people now coming up through the system, working through government, working through the private sector who are gonna now start to stand out. We were very close. My chief deputy, uh, Emma King Doyle, was, was a woman who would make a, an excellent chief of staff for a future president. Cedric Richmond, uh, an African-American uh, young man, is now in the, in the, uh, in the White House with, uh, with President Biden. So he'd make a good chief of staff. I just think it's, a, it's one of those things that's changing and when it changes, it'll never go back. So, and I think that's good and healthy. But but uh, I think you'll see those, uh, those, those changes coming fairly rapidly. Terrific. Well, in our last few minutes, I did want to hear um, your story. Like, give me one story that you think really illustrates either the best parts or the worst parts of being chief and maybe gives us a takeaway here of what our, our, our friends in the audience can, um, you should be taking away from our conversation. And uh, Mac, I'm going to go back to you again as our, as our I, I've appointed you as dean. <laughs> <laughs> Richard, a couple of comments. Uh, one opening comment, I want to make certain that in this forum uh, that's sponsored by the Washington Times and Philip Morris and others, uh, that we remember that there are 
key constituencies outside the White House and the Congress. I think it's imperative that the president have a pulse on the American people and engage in that manner, including with governors and, and local mayors. So I want to make that point up front, if I, I may, because I, I think I think we, that's important uh, in our discussion. In terms of kind of the high points and the low points, uh, West Wing, uh, the series, uh, uh, the television series captured that pretty well in their portrayal. What they didn't uh, quite make clear is they had a script that all of us didn't. We, we were operating without one. That's very different. For me, at least, the, the high point was when you would engage or have an opportunity to see real people in the real world. And you would have a, a chance to talk about a policy that you had enacted or supported, whether it be a jobs bill, a family medical leave act, whatever it might be, that had directly impacted the lives of Americans. That, to me, is, is where you really get your sense of fulfilling your public service and, and why you uh, why it's such a great privilege to be part of, 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 of a government and part of a uh, part of a White House. The low point to me uh, is when a colleague uh, has done his or her best but has not succeeded and you have to make a change there in some manner. Uh, and usually there's some some press surrounded with that. that that's always a very difficult personal uh, uh, personal situation or, or circumstance. And as all of the chiefs know, because they faced it, uh, I think the most difficult decision is, is to make a determination to send the brave men and women of our country into harm's way. That, that's the most sacred responsibility, I think, of any president is the security and safety of the American people. And that goes with it, the commitment of troops when called for. Mm. So the best part is when you get to see how your decisions impact the lives yep. of, of real people, real Americans, um, although there are no fake people or fake Americans either. So <laughs> it's great. It's great when you get to see people and how they're that, actually. Uh, being yeah, that's the, that's the real world. Yeah. But also then the, the solemn decisions of sending troops into combat uh, and may, having to decide somebody needs to leave uh, their position. Um, right. Thank you, um, Mac. Uh, Andy, your thoughts? What's your your story? Very similar to Mac, but it, you know, I think first of all, it's a great privilege to be part of our democracy, and I want to polish our democracy. And I think presidents have a responsibility to keep our poli our, our policy process such that the American people know that it's their government. The, mm. We, the people, that's the most important thing for a president to understand. But to help the president carry the burden, um, I, I will also say this. I've learned that no nobody who runs for office is as smart as they claim to be. Now Mick is really smart, Josh Bolton's really smart, Max really smart, but nobody nobody who runs for public office is as smart as they claim to be, and no one who who serves in government is as smart as they need to be sometimes. And we all have an obligation to educate the people who are running for office, serving in office, and working in, in our government. And unfortunately, if you do that more than three times, you're a lobbyist, and that shouldn't be a bad term. It's a great term. I want to make sure people in government are educated every day, and I also as chief of staff, I loved going to work every day, loved it. And I wanted everybody who worked for the president to really be excited to go to work. But I also, thanks to Josh Bolton, benefited by having Josh tell me every day, thank you very much for today. There may not be a tomorrow, basically. He was basically saying, thank you. It's been great. And when, you're, when it comes time to say goodbye, it's a tough thing to say goodbye. But it's very important that our democracy be dynamic and people say goodbye when they've worn out their welcome, when they've lost the pleasure, or when they've just run out of ideas. That reminds me of a line from The Princess Bride. You, you did a great job today, Wesley. I'll probably kill you in the morning. But. <laughs> <laughs> very good, very good. So I'm hearing if we need to be, if, if I'm in the audience right now, I should think about how I can educate our leaders and bring those perspectives um, to them. Uh, Mick, your thoughts here, either your story or what, what's your takeaway from today? Um, just real quickly, and Andy hit a nail on the head. I, I love the job. I had a blast. And I know it doesn't come across that way. And the, the, when you look at the world, I guess if there's a lesson to any of this, if you look at the world through the lens of anybody else, I don't care if it's left wing press, right wing press, whatever, you're not going to see what the real world is. Real world was we loved our jobs. We really did. And we wanted to make sure the people who were working there 
love their job. If I have any criticism of any of my predecessors is what we sort of knew they hated the job and it's a hard job to do uh, as it is, but you, you loved it and I loved every minute of it. I was glad when it was over, but was glad every single day. I, I, I don't know if I've got a high point or low point, but I have a story that I think just hits, just describes exactly what the job was. It's very brief. I mean, the, one morning before the president comes down, one of the lawyers walks into the outer oval and says, um, can I see the president? I'm like, why? So we got a great decision on, a, on, a, on an immigration case um, th th last night in the, in the fourth circuit. I want to tell the president, I said, that's great. Yay team, good for us, we put him in a good mood, great. We go in there, everybody's happy. The same day, about <laughs> eight o'clock at night, my phone rings and my phone never rang in the office. People would come get me, my phone rings and it's the same lawyer whose office is right above mine in the, in the, in the Oval Office. I'm like, yeah, and he goes, hey, listen, you gonna see the president uh, tonight? I'm like, yeah, I see the president every night. Why are you calling me? Well, we got a really, really bad decision today in the, in the Ninth Circuit on immigration. Uh, I'm, I'm getting ready to leave town to go to a conference in Chicago. So <laughs> please tell the president the next time you see him. That was the job. Um, and there's a reason that, that, that most folks have a limited life expectancy in this position because you get paid to tell the president what he doesn't want to hear. Um, and if you're doing your job right, um, you're, you're probably not the most popular person in the building for a long time. But I liked Andy's description about working at the pleasure of the president, but never working to, to gain the pleasure of the president. I will keep that one forever. Mm -hmm. Anyway, thanks for having me today. I appreciate it, Richard. Thanks, Mick. Um, Josh, I'm going to give the last word to you. Uh, uh, first of all, great pleasure being with these with, with these great chiefs and and you, Richard. Thank you. Um, it, it it was a joy to serve as chief of staff, and and I, every chief of staff will joke about the difficulty of the job, but will tell you it was a joy. Uh, they won't talk about some of the really trivial great pleasures of being chief of staff, like getting to go to all the state dinners and things like that. I uh, I got to take my mom. Uh, to the state dinner for Queen Elizabeth. Uh, oh. She was my date. And they, were, they were exactly the same age. Um, and, and just to have a lifetime memory for my mom of you know, being in line with Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip was, uh, was almost worth the, uh, the price of admission by itself. Uh, but there are a lot of other, other joys. Uh, Andy presided over the best event, I think, ever at the White House when the president... Bush invited all of the uh, all of the living Hall of Fame baseball players to uh, to come to dinner at the White House, and so those of us who got to go to dinner with this this in the East Room with all of these Hall of Fame baseball players that that's a lifetime memory. Um, the most important times for me as Chief of Staff were the time in the early morning. Uh, President Bush would get to his desk usually no later than six forty five. And that was the chief's time. Now, when Andy was chief, Andy had already been at the office for an hour and a quarter before then. I, I was just barely getting into the office. Uh, but that's when you had a chance to really talk to the president, see what was on his mind. Uh, and those were the important moments. I used to, uh, I used to start every day with when I worked for Andy and then when I worked for the president by thanking them for the privilege of serving, mm. which wasn't trying to butter them up. It was a reminder to me of something that I rarely need rem needed reminding of, which was the privilege of going through those gates every day and, and being in the White House. And I remember one morning I walked in and it was a particularly bad day for the president. I think we had we just gotten thumped in the 2006 midterm elections. The war in Iraq was going very badly. And I said, Mr. President, thank you for the privilege of serving even today. And he looked up and he said, especially today. Mm -hmm. That's a great poignant moment to leave, to leave on our, our conversation. And gentlemen, I wanna really thank you for uh, spending this time with us today. I'm taking away so much from the conversation. Um, I'm gonna close our part of it and start to move on to our second panel. So second panelists, if I can ask, ask you to come on the camera and come off mute. Uh, White House Chief of Staff, thank you so much. What I'm taking away from this conversation is that the issues that are gonna dominate the next 100 days will include the recovery from, from the coronavirus, looking at how we can reach out uh, and create unity, especially around issues like the infrastructure bill, how American leadership is gonna show up in the world as we deal with unforeseen occurrences, both domestically, uh, like the increase in, and potential increase in inflation, uh, and, and as well as internationally, on um, continuing to resolve issues around the pandemic, dealing with China, the Middle East, but also thinking about 
how the budget is going to potentially start to dominate uh, our politics or may become a dominant issue over the next few days. From a process point of view, I'm listening in and I think we're gonna carry this into our next part of our conversation, issues around how do you make decisions? Who makes decisions? How do you delegate? How do you deal with time and time pressure? And how do you build trust and manage conflict across a team? White House Chiefs of Staff, thank you so much. It's been wonderful having you with us. Um, next panel, I'm gonna bring up our chief, our, our chief executives and chief innovation officers. Goodbye, White House Chiefs, thank you so much. Um, and I see our, our, our other chiefs have joined with us. Um, and please do come on to camera if you can, please, um, as we, as we uh, start to move into our next panel. Um, and I see Anmay Chang is with us. Um, Yasek Olchek is with us. And uh, Eric Hargan is with us. And George Allen is with us. Uh, so uh, folks, I wanna turn to you and I'm gonna put the same question to you that I put to our, our first panel which is what do you think are the issues that are gonna dominate the next 100 days? And in particular, I, I'd love for you to build off of, you can either go deeper on one of the other issues that were discussed, um, or you can present new issues that you think are going to dominate the next 100 days. And uh, I wanna turn first uh, to you, Anmay Chang. Anmay, you and I got to know each other when you were Chief Innovation Officer uh, for the US Agency for International Development. But before that, you served as Senior Engineering Director at Google, you also served as Chief Innovation Officer for Pete Buttigieg's campaign. Um, and you're also the author of Lean Impact. Uh, so when you're, when you're think, give us the perspective from Silicon Valley or from USAID or, uh, or out on the campaign, what do you think are gonna be the dominant issues for the next 100 days? Thank you so much, Richard. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, I would say three things, COVID, COVID and COVID. <laughs> Um, you know, certainly here in the US, we're turning the corner where we're moving into the recovery from COVID, which is also really important. But we, we can't um, keep take our eye off the ball because COVID is still an issue around the world. And if we don't attend to both the, the response and the recovery around the world, we may be hit right back again. So, you know, in during the course of the pandemic this past year, we had to stay focused here at home. But now that we've had this fortune to begin transitioning back to some semblance of normal life, we can't lose sight of the fact that America's health and prosperity is inextricably linked to the rest of the world. From a health standpoint, estimates are that most developing countries will not have widespread access to COVID-19 vaccines before 2023. That's like two years from now. And beyond just the shots themselves, we're already seeing signs of trouble when it comes to distribution, administration, and vaccine hesitancy. So while so much of the world remains vulnerable, we run a serious risk of third, fourth, and fifth waves of the pandemic, which we're seeing all too vividly right now in India. And because we can, um, you know, as the pandemic continues to surge around the world, it can fuel muta mutations that evade our growing immunity here in the United States. Perfect, go ahead. Sorry? No, I, go ahead, I, I thought you were done, but go ahead. So, so we need to turn our attention more fully to the global response. But beyond the health implications, we also need to contend with the increasingly globalized nature of the socioeconomic toll. Over 100 million more people are estimated to have been pushed into global poverty, into extreme poverty. Um, and beyond our moral obligation to address the suffering, we're already seeing the impact on markets, supply chains, and travel reverberate around the world. So we all, we're also going to need to invest globally to ensure a full recovery. And finally, here at home, we're going to have to confront what looks like, to me, a tale of two cities in our own recovery. Because for the more privileged, while normal life was severely disrupted, many jobs could be done remotely, and those with investments have seen their net worth soar. But for the disadvantaged, many lost jobs and livelihoods. Their children are falling behind in education, and they may even be losing their homes. So this is going to have significant implications for our own recovery, where we must grapple with this divergence of fortunes that's happened in the last year. Mm. So COVID is going to be the dominant issue in your view. And in particular, uh, we're, we need to think about the, the immediate response, particularly around the distribution, the supply chain, also dealing with hesitancy issues. We've seen people pushed into more extreme poverty globally, uh, as well as here at, at home. And we've also got these issues of how do we get recovery going until people are are healthy and feel comfortable again traveling and meeting and, and, and going places. Uh, I want to turn, thank you, Anmay. I want to turn now to, to Indranil Ghosh. Indranil, you're the CEO of Tiger Hill Capital, a leading sustainable investment strategy firm. Um, you were also the head of um, Mubadala, the nation of Abu Dhabi's sovereign wealth fund. 
Um, and you're the author of Powering Prosperity, A Citizen's Guide to Shaping the 21st Century. What do you think? Build off of what Anme said, also what you heard in our Chief of Staff Forum. Uh, what do you think are going to be the dominant issues? Well, first of all, thank you for having me uh, on the on the on the show, uh, Richard. I think the first hundred days has been very good for bringing um, extremely important issues like climate change, like supporting working families, and achieving racial equity to the center stage of the dialogue. And I think that's a, a really great achievement. But in the next hundred days, I think the attention needs to shift to not just the pandemic, but actually what's the specific policy proposals that are being put forward, how good they're going to be at delivering on these goals that have been set out and whether they'll help the U.S. to build back better or not. And for me, the key question within that is whether the bulk of the policies will be of the nature of federal tax and spend initiatives that create short-term jobs, yes, by spending money on retrofitting schools and government buildings and fixing roads, which are all very needed, don't get me wrong or whether the balance will actually tip towards measures where the government is incentivizing the private sector through regulation or you know, various incentives to invest in the key areas like clean infrastructure and healthcare and semiconductors so that we can build American innovation and leadership in these future industries. I think that is the key for the next 100 days to see whether the policy detail can give confidence around that. So we need to see if the policies are going to actually deliver on the promise uh, looking beyond the first hundred days, the next hundred days, rather, looking at uh, will these actually help America build back better? Will some of the needed infrastructure spending perhaps also uh, help to create American leadership into the future and really set us up for the 21st century? Um, terrific, thank you. Um, Yasek Olchek, uh, you're the newly appointed Chief Executive Officer for Philip Morris International, uh, having first, uh, having previously served as Chief Operating Officer. First, congratulations on your new role, but second, what are the issues going to dom that are going to dominate your next 100 days uh, as you're kind of getting settled in? And what do you think is going to dominate the agenda for the world? Well, thank you for having me here. To be very precise for me, I have a 94 days left to my 100 days, right? <laughs> About a week ago, I uh, <clears throat> got, uh, to, uh, I assume, the role of a CEO of Eddie Morris International. I actually have a very interesting recollection. I don't. I never was thinking in terms of the next hundred days because I, I, I actually don't understand where the hundred days are coming from. I am thinking next 30, 60, 90 days because we can very easily convert them into what's going to happen next month, month after, and the, 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 you know, and the following month. And I actually returned from a, you know a big meetings with all our employees at PMI, and I thought that you know you cannot leave your people in a vacuum of information, even if you know that you would continue with your strategy, which you know our vision, which in our case is to replace all the cigarettes in the world with the you know scientifically proven non-combustible forms of a, of a nicotine. It is worth repeating because you don't want people to speculate, you know, how far and how much you want to change this direction. So repeating that vision, even if this is obvious, is very important. And obviously, you know, we operate in 180 markets and I have to admit in some places the situation with regards to COVID is getting better. So, you know, some of our, you know, folks can see the end, the light at the end of the tunnel. But if I look into India, Pakistan, Indonesia, Philippines, you know, the world is not really that rosy. So now you need to understand how do you go and run the organizations, which inevitably is taking its, you know, different pace, different speed as we unfold from a, from a crisis. I believe it's very important for all of us that nobody is left behind. Because if you think, I mean, we're living in the global connected world, whether we like it or we don't like it, but I think altogether we have actually benefited from uh, uh, from the fact that, you know, we, we more or less, uh, you know, participate in this global economy in a positive sense of this of this world. And I think it would be very important and we'll recover from this COVID more or less in the same time. And if I see what is happening, you know, on occasions with, you know, the, the, the vaccine distributions, how different uh, 
uh, you know, problems are being solved. I think it's very important not to leave everyone behind because this will backfire on all of us later on. Mm. This is a mobility crisis and the thinking that the one country when it can regain its mobility in a sense that, you know, I can go to work, I can continue my daily routine, but I cannot go abroad. I cannot, you know, entertain the meeting with my colleagues abroad. I cannot go for a vacation. I cannot see my family abroad. I mean, I will very soon realize that everyone has to recover otherwise we'll never go back even close to what we used to have uh, before so no i am born optimist optimistic optimist i believe it's gonna happen but we have to be very very careful so i'm you know very mm -hmm. happy that i passed my first six days in pmi reconfirmed the visions we go smoke free vision was the right strategy is okay you always can find a better way of executing and accelerate the the path to to, to achieve that vision Mm. But, you know, it's effort worth uh, taking. And uh, I also realized one thing that, you know, in a business, you have this, uh, 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 you know, a fury, it's not a fury actually, but a concept of black swans that from time to time you see the black swan and this is this event which surprise everyone, etc. And I have to admit that the number of uh, black swans I've seen over the last 18 months is frankly speaking, worrying. Uh, mm. I wonder when was the last white swan I have seen recently because I see a Suez Canal, I see a COVID, I see a, I see a shortage of a CPUs. I, you have a number of the things which theoretically shouldn't have happened and all of a sudden everything is happening. So yeah. it's getting a little bit worried how many black swans are still in front of us. You're right, right, right. So um, I, your first job as a CEO is to get out and re reiterate the vision and make sure that people understand that uh, you're staying the course uh, and that, that uh, your commitment to ending combustible cigarettes remains your commitment, uh, but you're also seeing worrying signs because if it's an uneven opening, if it's an uneven recovery, it's not really a recovery uh, for any of us. And there's these black swans are coming faster and more furious at us. Uh, Eric Hargan, I'd like to bring you into the conversation. You were deputy secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services. You also served as acting secretary and as the department's chief regulatory officer. Uh, most people probably don't realize HHS is the biggest agency in the government uh, by budget, uh, what are you seeing? What 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 would you have been thinking when you were when you were in the chair, and what are you seeing right now? Sure, um, and you know, uh, by the way, it's an honor to be here, and actually an honor to have served uh, both the Bush and the Trump administration out of three of the four uh, chiefs that you had in the first part of the program. So uh, good to good to see them again. Um, well, you know, I'm going to echo what was said before. I mean, obviously me coming from the healthcare sector, uh, you see the wind down of the pandemic is really gonna be the story of the next hundred days, I believe. Uh, and I hope that uh, as we move forward, what is being done is we get the lessons learned, the positive sides that we've seen, uh, at least in the sector, things like the rise of telehealth, uh, a lot of innovation that happened. I was in the board of operation Warp Speed. We do not want to lose uh, what we learned uh, in the in the public sector and in the ability to collaborate with the private sector in such an effective way. Uh, and I think that these these things and as and as the uh, attention inevitably shifts, I think out of the United States in many ways into the international arena with the pandemic uh, because. Uh, what has been done here and in a number of other countries has been sort of is, I think, going to effectively quell the pandemic in large part. It's already happening here. Uh, inevitably, the attention is going to shift overseas, um, even inside the United States. But I think uh, the important thing is to figure out uh, what positive we can take away from this uh, and to build upon it uh, so that we can never, frankly, have to go through this again. Uh, excellent. So we have to figure out how do we continue the public-private collaboration? How do we encourage innovation? How do we, as we turn our sights to what's over the horizon and what's coming, uh, what's happening internationally, how do we make sure that we can uh, uh, deal with those issues and hopefully improve the ability for everyone to recover, uh, but also take away some positives from this, uh, from this pandemic? Um, yeah. That's fantastic. Uh, Lastly, George Allen, I want to bring you in. You were the Commonwealth of Virginia's 67th governor and a senator. Now, I know we're in the midst of the election cycle in Virginia, and I, I know the Republicans just picked their nominee for governor, but I want to steer clear of the politics of that race. And instead, I want to, I want to ask you about a, a kind of a unique thing in Virginia. Uh, I don't know if it's unique, but I know it's very rare in that the chief executive, the governor, can't run for re-election in, in successive terms. So you've lived through exactly what Governor Northam has lived through, 
the 100 days of this next 100 days where you're not seeking re-election. How would you be approaching these issues? What do you think are going to be the issues that are going to dominate for Governor Northam? But how would you be, re be dealing with the kinds of issues that might cement your legacy? Who are you calling? How are you reaching across the aisle? Uh, and how are you working with your fellow governors right now? Well, the last year that, well, you, you're always working for the people. And you're trying to keep the promises you made to the people when they gave you the honor and responsibility of serving. Uh, listening to Mac McClarty and the other chiefs reminded me that in every one of my cabinet secretaries' rooms, we had a, a, a picture of horses running across the open plains, rangeland, and said, you either make dust or eat dust. And we wanted to lead. And we, were, we started off at a full gallop with a loose cinch, and you don't have a lot of time. In fact, I think good executives, at least at the state level, what I did is we went through a whole list of all the promises I made. And, and then we decided what years we wanted to get things done. What did we want to get done and you know, focus on year one, year two, year three. We did not have anything for year four. So year four was going to be keep fighting for the, the priorities that didn't get done in year one, two, three, or four. So you still can get things done. You still can help people in, in improving their lives. Uh, we had a cabinet uh, and it was listening to the chiefs. I wanted a cabinet of people who knew more than I did or more knowledgeable than I was in their areas. Like Rob Martinez knew more about transportation and infrastructure than I did. I had a great secretary of commerce and trade. Kay James was perfect for a welfare reform, having grown up on welfare and transitioning to the idea of independence. So you can keep uh, doing things till the last moment. The Virginia governor's accorded a lot of responsibility to get things done. And you're saying, heck, to the very last day, I was making announcements of Geico or some other company, you know, making an investment in Virginia and creating jobs, which I, I'll say, that, you know, the best social program of all is a job. Mm -hmm. And so, you, we, you know, you still wanted to do all the regulatory reforms and, Make sure Virginia is the best place for people to invest, create jobs, learn, and raise their families. Part of it is you also want to celebrate your successes uh, and cement those successes and those legacies that they don't go away as soon as you leave. And, and so many of the things we did, whether it's truth and sentencing, making for which has made Virginia the best, the safest state, the lowest repeat offender rate of any state in the country, third or fourth lowest violent crime rate. Uh, the welfare reforms, the high academic standards, school performance mm -hmm. report cards, all of those are still there. Now they're under threat, but they, mm -hmm. they have survived Republican and Democratic governors in subsequent years. So you do want to cement those legacies and, and, and have the people understand why that actually matters to them in their lives, right. not just right. theoretically, but personally. So I'm hearing a couple of things, that, a couple of themes that I think we can pull into the next part of our conversation where I really wanna focus on how you go about making these kinds of decisions, how you engage stakeholders and how you know, the, the theoretical sausage gets made here. Uh, what I'm hearing from you, Governor, and what I've heard from others, and we, and we also heard from our chiefs, was the importance of who you're hiring, who you're putting in these different roles, how you set the calendar out and the priorities that you're gonna to try to achieve over your time in office and uh, uh, when you're starting to tackle different things. Um, and Janelle, I'd like to get your perspective as, you know, as, a, as an investment uh, officer, as a, as, a, as a chief executive yourself, uh, how are you going to, to think about the next 100 days? What are the kinds of decisions? How do you, make, how do you set up a, an investment portfolio to, to, to think about uh, maximizing return, a sustainable return uh, in, in the face of these all of these new uh, black swans that are coming at us, uh, as we heard from 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 from, uh, from Yasin. Look, it's a very difficult time, but it's also a time where there's an incredible opportunity because I think I would be looking for companies and actually states, you know, regional governments who are setting themselves up to be, you know, the leaders in a sustainable future. Because especially with the the demographic trends, with younger people. Um, you know, believing increasingly and wanting to, you know, uh, see regulation and practices that promote sustainability. It's a, it's a trend that's going to happen sooner versus later. So, you know, companies that are setting out their stall now, states that are setting out their stall now to compete effectively in that future are the ones to be, to be looking at. And there will be a competition. Now, I, I give an example like, you know, 
possible legislation around the, the clean electricity standard, right? That would require all electrical power production to be from renewables by 2035. And also grants and incentives announced uh, to potentially help uh, the building out of a network of electrical charging stations for EV vehicles. These are you know, big pieces of uh, legislation that create opportunities for all sorts of industries like geothermal and, and biofuels and energy storage, um, you know, agricultural um, uh, products that are more sustainable. And the companies that are setting up their stall now to take advantage of these opportunities are the ones that are going to be, you know, the champions of the future. And if you look at what's happened over the last 10 years, you know, companies like NextEra Energy that invested early into wind and solar are now more valuable than Exxon Mobil, which you know, didn't you know, put enough measures in place to be part of that transition. The next 10 years, starting with the next 100 days, are all about how we get ready for, for that you know, second wave of the, the, this sort of transition to the new green economy. And in, for, as an investor, I'm looking for the companies and the states and the local governments that are getting ahead of that, that curve and competing for the capital, competing for the talent, competing for the new opportunities ahead of their competitors. Mm -hmm. So you're looking for the jurisdictions, the states, the localities, the nations, as well as the companies that are setting themselves up for success uh, in, these, in this newly changed environment, uh, both to, to deal with perhaps changes in regulation, but also to deal with a changing in consumer attitudes and the black swans that, the, and the unforeseen events that might be coming, coming our way. Um, That's Yasser, cool. I'd like to pull you in. I, I know uh, Philip Morris International, you're, you're, you're trying to essentially reposition the company in some of the ways that Andrew just said, you know, to try to take advantage of changes in consumer preference and also to the introduction of new products uh, that would essentially end combustible cigarettes. So tell us, how, how are you thinking about how you're positioning the company and what are the steps you're going to take over the next hundred days to build trust and to build um, uh, confidence? Well, uh, six years ago, when we started our transformations, all our revenues were coming from a cigarettes as we know them, right? And from the combustible products. I mean, uh, last year, five years in a transformation, six years in a transformation, quarter of our revenue is already coming from the combustible, non-combustible, uh, I repeat again, scientifically substantiated alternatives to smoking. Now we set the very ambitious target objective, but I believe is attainable that by 2025, more than a 50% of our revenue should come through that alternatives. And in addition to that, I think we should be in a position to generate the first billion dollars for coming from the products which have nothing to do with the tobacco and nicotine. Because I believe the capability which we have built on the scientific sides on a clinical assessment, clinical development, can help us to pivot also part of our business into this into these territories. I mean, a few people only know that we have already some years ago invested, for example, in the startup in Canada, which today is on the third, uh, the last days of a third uh, stage uh, clinical studies on the COVID-19 uh, vaccine, which is produced. On the based on the plant that that plant happened to be a tobacco related or coming from the tobacco varieties plant, and this is where we shared with this company the knowledge which we brought to this business is our knowledge of agriculture and the knowing the genome of the plant etc. So it's a number of the capabilities which we have built while developing a better alternatives to smoking, which I believe can serve the company beyond the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years, and all the results is going to be a more sustainable, sustainable business. So the transformation, I, I guess, will never happen. I personally stop, you know, start hating almost the word of a transformation because it gives you the expectations. You start something on Monday and by next Wednesday over, you will never be over because if you have a creativity, innovations and a great people around you, you can now start going and moving the company into the territories nobody ever heard about. Uh, about. I think there will come a day, I will have to remind people that Philip Morris used to be a company which was selling cigarettes. Mm. And I think it's actually closer and the faster this may happen that, that many people can suspect. So um, this is where we are. So it's not, a, it's not a defined start and stop to a process, but really a very long journey. Uh, and, and what I'm hearing you say is that you're kind of assessing what are the assets that the company has? How can we bring those assets uh, to, to improve uh, our understanding of science and also uh, how those, those uh, products and services can help to 
uh, do other things that aren't related to tobacco and aren't related to, to combustible cigarettes and looking towards a future when Philip Morris International is no longer in that business. Um, Anme, I want to bring you in here. Uh, you know, Eric brought up the issue of, of innovation and continuing innovation and how do we make sure that we harness uh, American innovation for the benefit of the world and how we're going to do that both for, for America as well as for uh, getting to this uh, future that Yatsek talked about of, of not having an uneven um, uh, recovery. So as a chief innovation officer, how do you see the role of innovation? Well, I think that one of the biggest mistakes we make in government is that we treat most activities as if we're procuring a tank. That is, we think we know exactly what we want and that it's a matter of pure execution. Now, when we have a proven solution to an understood problem, this can work reasonably well. For the most part, the bureaucracy is set up to ensure fair procurements, compliance regulations, and that our precious tax dollars aren't wasted. But in the situations where our solutions are woefully insufficient or where the problem has shifted dramatically, these same systems stifle the risk-taking, the agility and the innovation that we need to succeed. And of course, you know, this pandemic is unlike anything we've seen in our lifetime. So we need to approach this with humility and focus our efforts not only on implementing solutions, but also finding solutions. Um, in the private sector, Bain described this distinction as an engine one, which is the core business or things we know how to do well already, and an engine two, or growth or innovation engine. Um, and what the government has not figured out how to do as well and is starting to make strides towards is developing that engine two. And I think mm -hmm. this current situation is going to force us to do so. Um, and I think a similar framework could be used where we identify where innovation is needed. Um, and then engage stakeholders in new ways, as Indra Nil described, as problem solvers, as co-creators, as innovators, where we incentivize the innovation that we need to solve the problems we don't yet have solutions for. Um, and, we, and, we, and we just saw a great example of this with the breathtaking speed at which vaccines were designed and tested and distributed toward, through this collaboration between the public and the private sector. Um, and we can learn from that. Uh, and recognize that many elements of our recovery are equally ambitious and are gonna require creative solutions. Um, mm. And this is gonna look different. It's gonna be a different way for government to work that can be unfamiliar. And I'd suggest three things. One is stop picking winners too soon. We need to let a thousand flowers bloom by embracing smart risk-taking and experimenting with a lot of different approaches to figure out what's gonna work best. Um, to do so, the second is we need to build in the agility to learn and adapt as the knowledge and the context changes um, for, for these problems. And third, we need to measure success, not solely based on the activities that are being performed, but also on the outcomes and the results. And, and like I said, this is gonna be a very different way that government needs to work more and more as we encounter you know, just, just these unprecedented challenges in front of us. Mm, terrific. I, I love that, that distinction between, it, it takes a different set of processes to find the innovation versus implementing the innovation, that engine one, that engine two. I know you, you mentioned Bain. I know Clayton Christensen has also written a lot about this of, around the innovator's dilemma and that, that sometimes the processes that we use to implement things actually crush uh, the innovations that we're trying to bring out. I, I think that's a great segue to bring in, uh, bring back in Eric. Uh, Eric, you were, you were in the room for Warp Speed. Uh, kind of tell, give us that perspective, like how, how reflect on what Anne May just said about the difference between finding and implementing and how that kind of worked or, or what, what happened there and her three takeaways about not picking winners too soon and yeah. uh, having the ability to learn and adapt and to measure outcomes. Well, I mean, that was, that was the essence. I mean, I was on, I was on the, the, the board there and the leadership in Warp Speed. And, you know, that was important that we had over a hundred vaccine candidates to start off with that the clinical group could go through to get down to seven, 14, then seven, then six, finally. And we had a number of options available. Uh, and really new technologies, uh, which had turned out to be successful and bring a much sooner end to this pandemic than we could have otherwise hoped uh, in, that, uh, in that area. But you know, with some of that, probably we engaged with the private sector, we could have done it even faster, uh, to be honest, but a lot of this was having to kind of, you know, kind of create on the fly. Uh, in many ways around the government, around eliminating as much bureaucracy as we could, uh, things that really didn't need to be in place that we could innovate around in terms of, you know, sort of pre-paying, uh, promising ahead of time, de-risking uh, a, a lot of the endeavor of finding the vaccines and the therapeutics. Uh, these were important, they were there, 
uh, it was all legal, but it hadn't been thought through. Uh, and now, hopefully, uh, those tracks have been laid and people will understand in the future how to do it. I think one of the important things here, though, is for us to think through in the future, and I think this very much goes off her point, is about the, the distinction we saw between, or I saw between the medical science and technology on the one hand, and then how it has been perceived and implemented. So the distinction between medical science and technology on the one hand, and public health infrastructure on the other, the messaging, uh, how things are perceived, and, and how we deal with the appetite in the public for these very definitive uh, and immediate answers to things that often do not have immediate and definitive answers right away. It's a balance between the scientific endeavor and the need for public policy and for answers to the public and guidance to them on what they should do. Uh, I don't, I have not yet, I, I haven't come to a conclusion about this. I'm not sure there is a conclusion about this at this time, but I think it's important uh, for us to continue uh, sort of <laughs> really thinking this right. through. But if I could, if I could part, press you on that point for a second, because one of the things we heard from the chief of staff was that oftentimes their job was to bring the conflict to a head and to you know, cause the decision to be made. You were, you're highlighting there that many of these issues hadn't been thought through. How did you get them to be thought through? How did you get them to be framed? And not necessarily you personally, but the, the warp speed process, like how, how did that re result in that different thinking? Sure. Well, you brought together leadership from a number of different areas uh, across the government. So there was HHS, there was Homeland Security, there was D Department of Defense. A lot of people brought together a lot of scientists, a lot of leaders uh, that were brought together in the room uh, to think through these things, whether they were lawyers, contracting officers, scientists, manufacturing uh, experts, distribution experts. We had to bring as many voices as possible into the room. There was simply no way to solve this problem with an existing small group of people. Uh, you had to bring more voices. You had to bring more perspectives into it. And that's how ultimately, in my opinion, it was successful because you had different groups of people who had different expertises. They all came back to leadership. In other words, to the leaders of the Warp Speed Project, but uh, at the, while they, while they were away, they were doing what they were best at doing. And so it did not turn into a single group of people, whether at HHS or otherwise, who was solving the problem. But we essentially decentralized a lot of the decision making uh, into, other, into other groups, companies, departments, uh, and so on, who could each take advantage of their own expertise, their own particular excellences to solve this problem. I think if we had tried to maintain a choke point and a, a single decision-making place, it ultimately would have failed. Uh, if we had placed our bets only on one vaccine or one therapeutic or things like that, it would have ultimately failed if we had chosen a national champion or something like that. Uh, I'm glad we didn't do that. Um, we had the resources to do it. Thank goodness for the taxpayers. Hmm. Anme, what did you think? How does that kind of accord with what you were just saying in terms of the process? I, I couldn't agree more. I think that that's absolutely true. And I, I think my point was that we should take the lessons from that, not only for developing the next vaccine or the next big picture big breakthrough, but also for the recovery, because there's mm -hmm. many, many unknowns in the recovery. We can't just think that we can pick an answer and then execute on that answer. I think we need to take that same spirit of, you know, trying a, a lot of different things, really iterating, um, really driving for better results and apply that to the recovery as well. Mm -hmm. Governor, I want to bring you in. Um, you know, again, as a governor, you have to balance so many different constituencies. You've got uh, the state government itself. You've got all the different localities. And I know the way that localities work with, uh, with Richmond is, is kind of different in Virginia than it is in some other states. You're also working with your, your neighboring states and your fellow governors and with the federal government. I, I have, when, you, when you reflect on, on both what Indra Nil said in terms of but placing bets on the jurisdictions that are preparing best for the for the world to come, and also on Anme and Eric's uh, and, and Yatsek's re reflections here about setting us up to uh, really uh, unleash innovation. W how do you see the role of the governor in doing that? Well, uh, a great deal <laughs> in it, and I, I really enjoyed listening to everyone's comments uh, because you do have to be willing to adapt, change, innovate, and improve. And if you don't, you'll be left behind. And uh, clearly there's competition between the states. In fact, uh, to the credit of President Trump, and I think it's probably gonna stay on, a lot of this COVID response has been left to the states. 
And then within the states, I, I think even regions or zip codes or counties and cities ought to be treated differently. The densely populated places where they have mass transit may have greater problems than folks out in the country. And we've seen that. So the competition between the states has always existed. The, the laboratories of innovation, the laboratories of democracy, and it's pretty clear who's winning and who's losing. There are rich states and there's poor states. And, and states like New York, New Jersey, Illinois, and now even California are losing population. Uh, the best states for business from Chief Executive Magazine traditionally, consistently, year after year in order are number one, Texas, number two, Florida, number three, Tennessee, number four, North Carolina, and then out west, States like Nevada and Arizona are doing very well. Now, what are the commonalities? They have comparative, comparatively lower taxes or no state income taxes. They have prompt permitting. They have affordable energy, which matters for manufacturing and data centers and everything else. They, they uh, have right to work laws where people are not forced to pay union dues as a condition of work. And then the other key is a, a skilled workforce from which to draw employees. And so the states that have that are the ones that are going to win in the future. I don't like the idea of a government-directed economy. I think free people in the free market ought to determine the winners or losers. Uh, this infrastructure bill, to the extent that there's agreement on it, will be on real infrastructure. And part of that will be broadband, uh, which is mm -hmm. important for connectivity. So it's as, as important as electrification was with the TVA and rural co-ops 80 years ago. But to the extent it is this Green New Deal idea, I don't think that's going to get very far because generally speaking, it's regressive and increases the cost of electricity, fuel, fuel, gasoline, and food for lower income families. So there'll probably be a divergence on that. But I think that the states, if, if you, and in fact, the way the states like Texas Texas and Georgia and Tennessee and Florida and South Dakota, they've been open. And in what, Virginia, you, what, right, what would you be doing right now to encourage greater cooperation and innovation within the different uh, parts of the state? But within here's Virginia what I did. Here's what I did. I, I would have I would have followed the policies. I like that. I commend the policies of the governors of Texas and Tennessee and Florida. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't lock down folks. There's no reason to have these mass well, mandates. I want I want to but, stay but, away from but the here's the big, right? here, yeah. here, here's the big thing that can be done. We are vulnerable as a country to pharmaceutical agents, ingredients that are fabric and manufactured in China and mm -hmm. some places that are not reliable. And BARDA, you, uh, Eric, you, you all with BARDA and so forth, we need to have these, these uh, pharmaceutical agents, active pharmaceutical ingredients. We need to have them, those manufactured here in the United States of America, or at least from allies that are reliable. That's important for our national health security rather than being vulnerable to countries that are, let's say, unreliable or certainly uh, some adverse to right. us. And I think that's vitally important and that's jobs, but that means you have a culture of investment, long-term mm -hmm. research and development, like the National Nanotechnology Initiative and others mm -hmm. that are so important for the private sector to actually develop these these medicines or, or devices for future health and, and uh, security. Yeah, so what I'm hearing from all of you is that we need to have an innovation um, culture that encourages, it doesn't, doesn't pick winners too early, where markets and, and a, a thousand flowers are allowed to bloom so we can see how these innovations are gonna play out. We need the ability to learn and adapt um, and measure success based on outcomes. I'm also hearing we need to have a clear focus on uh, supply chain security and making sure that we uh, understand where things are coming from and that we know how to balance our supply chain needs uh, and that we have a, uh, a focus on reopening all of the economy, not just the United States, not just individual uh, localities, but really getting everybody back into prosperity so that we can um, continue to, to grow. And we need to have a, uh, a way within our organizations for balancing different risks, in particular unintended or, uh, or uh, unforeseen risks and acknowledge that uh, while we are as companies or as organizations, we are competing, we're also competing as jurisdictions to get ourselves positioned for, uh, for the future. We're round, wind, winding up on our time here, but in the last uh, two minutes that we've got here, I'd love to hear one takeaway from each of you, one thing that you think people in the audience can go and do, or one 
big learning you think they should take away from this conversation, uh, both uh, our conversation now, as well as our conversations with the White House chiefs and, and governors that have got you, um, what would be your one takeaway? I think people listening, make sure your voices are heard by those who are making decisions. The people are the owners of the government. So whether it's your local government, state government, or those at the federal level, whether you're an association, whatever it may be, make sure that your personal stories, your voices are being heard. And that will help Mm -hmm. those making decisions make better decisions. Get your voice heard, help people make better decisions. Um, Eric Hargan, your thoughts. Um, My takeaway would be just from recent history, the ability of this country and its innovators are staggering. Uh, And it is it is a it is the jewel in this country uh, that has saved us this time from much human suffering. It's something that we need to protect and elevate in the country as we move forward. Make sure that we learn the lessons we just went through. Learn the lessons. Make sure the innovation continues. It's the jewel in the crown. Um, Jacek, your 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 takeaway. I think the time is when the one party, one person, one agency thinks that they can solve the problem and offer the silver bullet again. We're living in the times when you need the full collaborations, left, right, center, middle, all agencies, industries, regulators, in order to solve the mounting problems which are in front of us. Mm. Collective, collective action is needed to solve our problems. We need to come together and work together. Uh, Engineer Ghosh, your, your one takeaway. I think we all need to be prepared to embrace very rapid change because these black swans are probably going to become more the norm than the exception. But they're also moments of huge opportunity. Um, If you look back at this past pandemic, who would have thought a year ago that we would have moved so far in things like remote working, you know, moving out to different parts of the country, alleviating pressure on cities because we can do that now uh, to telehealth and all of the other amazing innovations that we've been forced into. Um, and, it, and, and as part of embracing change is that collaborative spirit, the public and private partnership, public and private capital need to come together to inject capital resources and talent into those opportunities. Mm. Big challenges, but big opportunities. Be prepared to adapt um, and, and strike when the iron is hot. Uh, Anmay, I put you on the spot to start, so I'm going to give you the last word, uh, your final thought. Um, I would say we've appropriated an unprecedented amount of money for the COVID response and recovery as a government. And it's an opportunity for us to show that government can be an incredible force for good. But to do that, we're going to have to not only get excited about the number of dollars and the areas that we're spending them on, but also look at how we're doing that. And that is going to require us to modernize government to make it fit for purpose for the 21st century problems that we're facing these days. Well, Anmay, Eric, Indranil, Yatsik, Governor Allen, I really want to thank all of you for taking your time today. I also want to thank all of our White House Chief of Staff for joining us. This has been such a fantastic conversation. I hope you and the audience got as much out of it as I did. I want to again thank our sponsors, uh, Philip Morris International and our co-hosts, the uh, the Washington Times and Collaborate Up for making this conversation possible. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining the Chiefs Forum. We'll see you next time.